In her book, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success, Carol S. Dweck wrote, The passion for stretching yourself and sticking to it, even or especially when it's not going well, is the hallmark of the growth mindset. This is the mindset that allows people to thrive during some of the most challenging times in their lives. Welcome to the A&P Professor, a few minutes to focus on teaching human anatomy and physiology with a veteran educator and teaching mentor, your host, Kevin Patton. In a special Journal Club episode, Krista Rumpolsky discusses how mindset affects achievement gaps in underrepresented minority students. And there's a new book club recommendation. Yep, I'm going to take a moment to remind you about that free ebook I've been talking about and talking about and talking about. It's a really short, really easy read called Pandemic Teaching, a Survival Guide for College Faculty. It's a free download from all the major ebook stores. Just go to books2read.com. That's books, the number two, read.com slash pandemic teaching. And pick out your favorite ebook store or simply search for it within your e reader or e reader app. Oh, yeah. And could you also take a moment to share that link with your teaching colleagues and in social media too? Really, I do appreciate your help with this. By the way, I'm preparing another episode with even more tips and techniques for pandemic teaching or any kind of remote teaching. So if there's something you have to contribute, or something you'd like clarified, or a problem that needs solving, or something I said that you want to debate, well, please contact me as soon as possible. So this is an early episode of the Journal Club. And what I mean by that is, um, if you joined us for our very first Journal Club episode for the AMP Professor, You may recall that we said that we're going to do this every couple of months, and that was only a few weeks ago (laughs) that we did that. And so we're like coming in way early with another journal club, and why are we doing that? And that's really a good question. That's kind of the central question of today's episode. To join us, as usual, with our journal club is our uh, journal club director, Krista (laughs) Rumpalski. And Krista, hello, and why are we here? Hi, Kevin. Uh, Nice to be back. Uh, Like you said, sooner than we expected. Uh, We are here because an article that I suggested to you months ago has become a bit more relevant uh, with the events of the world in the past few weeks than I had expected or anticipated. So I suggested that maybe uh, the best thing we can do is move this one way up on the docket rather than doing it before the start of the fall semester. And, and just talk about what this could mean for, for us as educators as well as our students. So the, the article, and I shared this with HAPS members, but I know that we're not all HAPS members in the listening audience. The article is called um, STEM Faculty Who Believe Ability is Fixed Have Larger Racial Achievement Gaps and Inspire Less Student Motivation in Their Classes, a Cross-Sectional Study. And the study was done um, in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Indiana University Bloomington, and it was published last February 2019. So there's a likelihood that a number of listeners may have seen it. But for those that haven't, uh, I think it is an absolute must read for any professor, um, particularly a professor in the sciences. When you first brought this, you know, you were going through a variety of different uh, possible topics or papers to look at in our journal club. And this is way before the most recent events in the news occurred. And um, you had winnowed it down and kind of asked my opinion on your short list. And, you know, they're all good articles. But when, when I read this one, and I remember having that discussion a number of weeks ago, when we saw this, you know, when I saw this one, you know, I said, wow, you know, this is something as you said, we all need to be looking at. And, uh, and boy, it was hard to figure out which, which paper should go first and which goes second and so on. 
And um, maybe it's a good idea that we held it back a little bit because now we it was there for us to bring it in when the timing is couldn't be better to consider these ideas. There's more to discuss, and we'll be right back after this brief message. A searchable transcript and a captioned audiogram of this episode are funded by AAA, the American Association for Anatomy. AAA always has something going on, and one way to find out what's new and happening in AAA is to go to their newly redesigned website at anatomy.org. Okay, we're talking about, wow, this is a great paper in very general terms, and the title kind of implies what it's about, but tell us a little bit more about what they did and what they found in the article. Yeah, sure. So I have my typical write-up, but I'll kind of do it a little bit more off the cuff than, you know, my, my more formal recording like we did last time. So essentially, and I'll just read a bit from the introduction, that uh, despite decades of research and millions of dollars in federal funding aimed to understand and um, ameliorate underrepresentation of diverse individuals in STEM, Racial and ethnic minorities, referred to in this article as URMs, um, continue to underperform academically relative to their white peers. And in this paper, they um, they lump white and Asian students together as the not underrepresented minorities. And you know, I'm sure we could have a conversation about that. But just statistically speaking, in terms of performance academically, that's how they classified it. So. You know, they acknowledge that there could be multiple factors here with achievement gaps, but they may be exacerbated by subtle situational cues from their STEM professors that, you know, reinforce racial stereotypes, and which is known as the cues hypothesis. They looked at a really novel situational cue, the belief that college professors in STEM either have a fixed or malleable mindset about student ability. So essentially, whether they believe that student ability is changeable, whether it can grow, you know, having a growth mindset versus if intelligence and ability are fixed and how potentially professors interact with their students, the the subtle or less subtle potentially cues they send to students in their classrooms about that. And what they essentially found was that there's much larger gaps in achievement between professors that have a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset for all students, but then that gap widens substantially between white students and underrepresented minority students in professors that have a fixed mindset. That's the kind of like the quick findings. There's obviously a lot more in terms of things they tried to tease out, such as, okay, is there a difference in whether the professor is themselves an underrepresented minority or not? whether they're a male or female or not, whether they've been teaching 30 years or three years or not. And consistently, none of those things changed at least the statistical findings. So no matter what the professor's particular demographic or experience level, consistently it was mindset that was predicting the the GPA and performance differences between, between students. So that really rocked me because as I kept reading the article and looking at the things they controlled for or analyzed, I was like, well, it's going to be age, right? Because, you know, maybe older professors don't view themselves as, you know, needing to attend to how to learn the subject versus just the subject itself, which is something we talked about in the last podcast. Or, you know, maybe it was more male professors. No, no offense, Kevin. You know, I think <laughs> you're, getting, you're kicking them all off here. Older, yeah. male. <laughs> yeah, but I, I kept thinking, well, something is going to pop up to explain this more than just, or at least explain who has the fixed mindset. And then what really surprised me was, um, and maybe it shouldn't, but even the black and Hispanic professors still had the same results in their classrooms. So, you know, I was just left thinking, my goodness, what am I doing or not doing? What are all of us maybe doing or not doing to send messages that can substantially impact, you know, not only someone's performance in a class, but whether they continue on in a major. And especially in A&P, you know, it gets labeled a weeder or gateway course so often. And and we've all known the stats, you know, nationally on A&P success. 
I think while we can maybe think this doesn't apply to us, I, I think it applies to A&P professors tremendously, especially given the his history of lack of representation in anatomy, you know, and medicine in general that, that we all know is very much there. So, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> that's the yes, kind of the, the less formal, you know, recorded summary of this paper. And obviously, there's a lot more to look at you know, some discussions about what, how they measured mindset, you know, how they did all of their statistical analyses. And then of course, you know, author suggestions or discussion about, you know, why, why these results are that the way that they are and what we can do to change it. So, you know, everyone should read this paper that's listening. Um, Everyone should take it and consider what they are, aren't doing in their classrooms that could potentially, you know, that, that could potentially be changed in this as a result of reading this for the st- sake of their students. Yeah, I want to circle back to a few of the things that you mentioned that are in the paper and talk about them a little bit. But before I do that, I want to mention another aspect of the context in which we're talking about this in this particular episode. Krista and I were uncertain today whether we should record this or not, because we have two white professors talking about education of underrepresented minorities. And should we include some panelists uh, that are from underrepresented minorities, either students or professors or both, and expand the conversation? And I think that would be a valuable conversation to have, and it's important. And what happened was, as we were discussing whether we should record anything now or expand our panel or not, we found ourselves having the discussion. And so we decided, well, let's just go ahead and record it and have this discussion because it is important, I think, for white people and uh, people of color to have this conversation with each other. But I think it's important for all of us under any number of circumstances to have these conversations. So I'm not going to wait until we have someone of color to talk about this. I want to talk about it now. And then I want to talk about it again with people who may have experienced this as a student and have made it, have become successful in a STEM field. And what was their experience like? And what can I do better as Kevin, but also as a white professor and an older male white professor. <laughs> and, you know, you, you brought that up. And, and it, Krista, that wasn't your idea. I mean, that was talked about in the paper. Uh, they talked about this concept that we often have, and I agree that it's out there, that older white men seem to be the gatekeepers of the STEM fields. And I, I don't think it's seem. I think we have been. And I don't think that that's good for anybody. <laughs> And it's not good for society. And that's kind of the context in which we're talking about this whole thing, right? Is this idea that what can we do? And as an older white male who recognizes this problem, whenever I'm confronted with it, I think to myself, I don't like that. I don't want to be part of that problem. I don't think I am, but maybe I am. Maybe I am part of that problem. And so how... How can I change that? How can I, as an individual, old white male professor, how can I change that? What can I do that actually has an impact? Now, we know that there are social things that we can all do to engage in that overall conversation, but what can I do in my seat as an A&P professor? What can I do there? And I think one of the things I can do is to make sure that all of my students whether they have certain advantages or not certain advantages, whatever their mindset is as a student, that I do the best that I can help them. And this paper, I think, is a breakthrough paper. This is a paper that tells us exactly what we can do. And so circling back to what some of the content was, Oh, and by the way, before I move on, I just want to say that given the fact that we realize that this needs to be an ongoing and broader conversation, I invite people to call into the podcast hotline, contact Krista or me directly, email us, whatever, and we can continue this conversation in future episodes. We want to continue this conversation. I think it's an important one. But for now, this is the conversation we're having, and it's about this research. So circling back, one of the things that, that Krista, that you brought up 
that I want to kind of get back to is this multi multiple layers of research they did. I Every single time when I read this paper, I would have a question like, yeah, but what about? In the next paragraph, they would say, well, yeah, what about? <laughs> and they would address it. And just, it, it was my my jaw was dropping because I was seeing that, you know, a lot of people feel like, you know, it's the older professors who might have more of an issue with this mind fixed mindset issue than the younger professors. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm an older professor, my prejudice is I see it more in younger professors when I talk to them. So I have the opposite prejudice. And yet we see that, that, you know, yeah, everybody, anybody can have these fixed mindsets, whether you're young or old, whether you're uh, uh, white or not, whether you're male or female, whether you're experienced in teaching, not as experienced in teaching. And, uh, and so they, they went through and they knocked down each one of those possible confounding factors. Yeah, I th yeah. I think it's also important to highlight the fact that, you know, while I didn't have this in my first summary, they did look at the course evaluations from students that were in all of these classes. And bear in mind in the results from these, the students didn't know that this larger study about mindset belief was going on. So, you know, they didn't know that they were potentially rating or evaluating a course taught by a professor in, with one mindset or another. But um, just some quick notes, they, the, the authors examined four semesters of student average course evaluation for the faculty who responded to the survey to try to shed light a little bit more on the student experiences in those courses. And, you know, they reported that consistent with the theory that mindset belief is associated with motivation, um, students reported much less motivation to do their best work in classes taught by faculty who endorsed fixed mindset beliefs. They said that those professors were less likely to emphasize learning and development, which makes sense, and they were less likely to recommend the course and the instructor. But I think the most interesting part of that is that the students didn't report any differences in like the time commitment or difficulty or demand of the course, which basically suggests that that is not a factor that predicts student satisfaction. So we can't say, oh, we get bad course evaluations because we ask them to work really hard. Students want to work hard. They just want that the work that they put in to line up with the results, which any who doesn't right in any aspect of our lives. So that that could apply, you know, sort of outside this paper. I think that's an interesting or the topic. I think that's an interesting finding that it's not that students just want easy classes or that they just write, you know, good course evaluations for easy classes or non-demanding classes. So I thought that was an, you know, especially interesting thing to add into that. So it all adds up, you know, and, and <laughs> it's it's seemingly something that seems so obvious. Um, but then, you know, how do you endorse a can you change your mindset belief? How do we change mindset beliefs if they're identified? Who wants to admit that they have a fixed mindset belief, you know, <laughs> and um, and what do we do about it? But I think what's so important or that the bigger takeaway from this paper is that if that's something that is easily fixed, look at the impact it could have because of all the other factors that didn't predict the findings, at least in this paper, just that mindset belief. So we should be targeting and throwing so many more resources at mindset belief in in professors and you know that's on us and I, I think that that's something that can be you know relatively easily done with you know some workshops or some readings or some part of required training before you uh come onto campus and start interacting with students <laughs> since we get basically no education training whatsoever you know right. um just the expertise in our field and i know that that's changing but i think that wasn't something this uh, this is the first time I've even, I was ever exposed to this term, fixed and growth mindset. So I think I've got a very growth mindset with my students and, you know, with other people in my life. But it really still made me sit back and think hard and, and painfully about what I've missed over the years and what I could have done better. We'll be right back in a moment. The free distribution of this podcast is sponsored by the Master of Science in Human Anatomy and Physiology Instruction, the HAPPY degree. This is an online program for AMP faculty who already have an advanced degree to review all the major concepts of AMP and brush up on current teaching practice. 
including skills helpful for pandemic teaching. If you're listening to this before June 25th, there's a virtual open house for the HAPPY program on that date at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. You can go to the APProfessor.org slash OpenHappy, that's Open H-A-P-I, to register. And you can check out details about the HAPPY program anytime at nycc.edu slash happy. Or click the link in the show notes or episode page. There's a new cohort forming right now, so yeah, now is a good time to be taking that step forward in your professional development. Something that was that I noticed in this article that was kind, seemed like kind of an uh, not really offhanded remark, but it didn't really pop out. It, it was almost an aside, and that was they said it would take almost no extra money or effort to do some training of all faculty in this idea. I mean, just just reading this paper, I think, can do a lot. Uh, just to expose the issue and make people aware of it. And then I think that it really doesn't take a lot for people to understand, you know, what their own mindset is, where they are on that spectrum. And I'm sure it is a spectrum and not black and white. Sure. But, you know, they're on the spectrum. Where on the spectrum are they? And now they can see the value of changing their position on the spectrum. And they can think about, well, what can I do to change that? And, you know, in a training session, they can be exposed to some ways of self-identifying those behaviors as they happen and, and catch themselves with those filters that they have and recognizing what the filters are and when they're, they're interpreting things through those filters or expressing things through those filters, you know, how that can affect it. But, you know, you, you mentioned the idea of, you know, the fact that, you know, higher ed faculty, we don't, we're not certified teachers like right. they are in K-12. And so we don't have that pre-training, although a lot, as you mentioned, more and more people are coming in with that pre-training. And I think more and more faculty, once they're there, realize they need the training yeah. and they're getting that on their own in a variety of ways, both formally and informally. And on this podcast, I've mentioned before the HAPPY program, which is a master's degree in anatomy and physiology instruction. And there are some other formal degrees. But I, the reason I mention it is because this is a discussion that we always have in my course. And like you, I don't think of it in terms of this terminology. This terminology was new to me. I mean, I've used the term mindset before, but not in this context. And I didn't think of, you know, fixed mindset or growth mindset. But the, the concept itself, even though we didn't call it that, comes up a lot in our course. And there's one discussion in particular where it touches on that. And it's a discussion where I give them some examples of things that we can do as AMP professors to help students learn how to learn, to do, you know, expose them to the idea of metacognition and how that can help. Uh, what some different strategies are for studying and and so on. And I didn't get much of that as an undergraduate. I mean, I, I did get some of it when I went to my professor's office and said, I'm having a hard time with this course, yeah. or I'm having a hard time in college or whatever, which I did. I really struggled my first year. So I got help that way, but nobody suggested that I get that help. It wasn't part of the course, and it wasn't yeah. ever mentioned in class. So I kind of bring up the idea of, should we mention it in class? Is that our role as an A&P teacher to teach students how to learn and how to study and how to be successful? So I throw that out there and the discussion ensues. And you can see this, what I can now call, because I've read this paper, growth mindset and fixed mindset. Yeah. And you can see that spectrum reveal itself. And then we discuss and we go back and forth and point out different things. And it usually, and this is something I discovered about discussions as a learning tool, because I always thought, what good is discussing? I mean, yeah, maybe in the sociology class, but in, <laughs> in you know, in something like A&P, what good is it to discuss? You know, in this discussion, we, we arrive at a place where people have moved closer to that growth mindset. They might not be all the way at the other end yet, but they've moved toward that just by talking it out. And so it could be that somebody listening to this episode may, just by listening to this conversation and thinking it through, might move a little bit on that spectrum toward the growth mindset. Yeah. And then if they follow up and read the paper, I'm sure they're going to move a little bit. 
And then if they bring that to their peers and start discussing it, it's going to move a little bit more and they're going to get other people to get it to move. So hopefully it can, you know, can really spread. But I just want to emphasize the point that maybe it's just discussions that can get us started and get us partly moved along that spectrum. Yeah, I I agree with everything you've said. I think that at least from my own experience, this all hinges on people wanting to have that discussion and, and, and being open to change. Because it is scary, I think, you know, whether it's just talking about how you structure your class and communicate with your students versus your larger beliefs and attitudes and actions in the world. But if you feel overwhelmed by change, you know, sometimes the reaction is to sort of dig deeper in your position versus open yourself up. And I'll kind of just leave it at that. You know, but they said in the paper, you know, as a as a reason for sort of why does this fixed mindset potentially have so much harm or influence is that, you know, it's likely to shape the way you structure your course, how you communicate with your students, or how you encourage or discourage persistence. You could do those things. You can encourage and student persistence and communicate better without having to change a single lecture PowerPoint. Like these are, it isn't this potentially massive overhaul. I mean, maybe if the more you change, the better the results, but you can start with really subtle things. I mean, I kind of always think back to, this has nothing to do with this, but how like one sentence or one moment can just totally sort of like either make or break someone. And I always go back to, I forget what year it was, but when Howard Dean was running for president and he made that goofy noise and it was like, like his, <laughs> his campaign was over or something like that. <laughs> right, so right. I think as a professor, yeah. like what is like, I could in one sentence in one class drastically change the tone for better or worse in my class. And I think that's the idea that it's trying to get a- across that we make, whether we want to be, whether we want to acknowledge this or want this to be the case or not, I think we have to acknowledge that we make such a bigger impact on our students' life, their whole trajectory than we think, especially in these classes that are foundational and so often labeled that gate, that gateway or weed or course, which I struggle tremendously with when I hear that because, well, why were they allowed into the college then if you know, we expect that we're going to have a certain amount of melt, right? Like, I I think it's changing the phrase that, you know, there some students, rather than saying some students will fail, and we expect that, then to just some students may fail. And I realize that that's one word, but just reflect on that for a second. That's so subtle. We acknowledge that, yes, definitely, there may be some students that don't pass the class. But saying will is a fixed mindset example that we expect and that's necessary. I mean, I've, that's terminology I've heard, you know, my, throughout my entire teaching career from administration or other professors and things like that. And I just, it just feels so unfair because if we know that, why are, why are we setting them up for that, you know, from, from coming in? And I realize that college is a business that has to stay open and <laughs> depends upon tuition But, you know, it is clearly in this paper and so many other things you are, you know, we're especially hearing about now more than ever, it is disproportionately affecting underrepresented minorities. And we we have to change this. We just have to do something about this, you know, now more than ever. Well, I can't agree more, Krista. And I really appreciate you bringing this paper to my attention and to the attention of all of our listeners. Um, we could go on and on talking about these things. Uh, you know, I really, you know, join Krista in strongly recommending that you read this paper, uh, share it with your colleagues and so on. And there's a lot more in this paper than we had time to discuss right. in this episode. For example, Krista just gave an example of a way that we live out a fixed mindset. There are many examples in here of things that uh, are examples of a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. So if you're a little bit unclear still as to what that means exactly, read the paper yeah. and then then look through some of the um, citations 
uh, that they make here, and that, that gives even more information about what they're talking about here. But this is what I hope is the beginning of a long conversation in the mm-hmm. anatomy and physiology teaching community. And, and again, I encourage everybody to call in, write in, whatever, so that we can continue this conversation in this podcast, as well as in the broader a teaching community. So Krista, thanks again for a wonderful Journal Club episode. We're looking forward to your next paper. Boy, it's, <laughs> this is going to be a hard one to beat, but I know you got some really good ones on your short list and you're adding more all the time. So thanks again for uh, hosting the Journal Club for us. I just want to thank uh, the dean of where I work, Moravian College in Bethlehem, PA. Um, her name is Dr. Diane Husick. She shared this uh, prior to a faculty meeting in October with all of us and felt so compelled to share this and many other similar resources about mindset beliefs and tried very hard to have a faculty-wide conversation uh, about these topics at one of our faculty meetings. And I consistently thank her because I don't think any paper has ever made a bigger impact on me, um, both as a professor and just as an individual moving around in the world. So, you know, I told her I was going to try to um, cover this paper on a podcast, and I just want to acknowledge, um, acknowledge her efforts and how proud I am to be part of the college that I am, that our leadership from the top down is is, is trying to start these conversations. So thanks, Diane, if you happen to have time to listen in the middle of all the fall pandemic planning. <laughs> <laughs> Marketing support for this podcast is provided by HAPS, the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society, promoting excellence in the teaching of human anatomy and physiology for over 30 years. Go visit HAPS at theapprofessor.org slash HAPS. That's H-A-P-S. Hey, if you're on Facebook, you may want to check out the new Facebook group for HAPS. You know, next time you're wandering about aimlessly on your Facebook feed. Well, it's time for my appointment at the Corner Bookstore. And I'm here to pick up a book that I ordered recently. After reading the study that Krista Rumpolsky and I discussed in this episode, I became curious about the concept of mindset, and in particular, how mindset affects learning, and by extension, how mindset affects teaching. So I went back to the source, a book called Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. This book first came out in 2006 and became a huge bestseller. Where was I? I completely missed it. Well, you know, there wasn't a book club for a and faculty back then, so yeah, that's probably how I missed it. Well, anyway, the Mindset book is now available in an updated version, and that's what I've ordered from my bookstore. After decades of research and motivation, renowned Stanford psychologist Carol S. Dweck discovered a simple but groundbreaking idea, the power of mindset. In her book, she shows how success in school, work, sports, and the arts, and almost really every area of human endeavor, can be dramatically influenced by how we think about our talents and abilities. People with a fixed mindset, those who believe that abilities are fixed, are less likely to flourish than those with a growth mindset, those who believe that abilities can be developed. The Mindset book reveals how great teachers and other coaches and leaders can put this idea to use to foster outstanding accomplishment in our students. In the updated edition, Dweck offers new insights into her now famous and broadly embraced concept. She introduces a phenomenon she calls false growth mindset and guides people toward adopting a deeper, truer growth mindset. She also expands the mindset concept beyond the individual, applying it to the cultures of groups and organizations, and even courses and classrooms. With the right mindset, you can motivate your students to transform their lives and your own. I'm going to try this out. This sounds great, and so that's why I'm adding it 
to the A&P Professor Book Club. Now, in our journal club discussion, Krista and I kind of left it hanging about what steps we A&P faculty can take in tackling the issue of our mindset's impact on achievement in our students, particularly among underrepresented minorities. This is where I'm going to start. Why not join me? Don't forget that there are links to the study that Krista brought to us in this Journal Club episode in the show notes and episode page at the approfessor.org slash 71, as well as links to the book club recommendation and links to our sponsors. You know that you're always encouraged to call in with your questions, comments, and ideas, right? But as we said earlier in this episode, we want to extend this conversation. Why not call us with your comments and questions at the podcast hotline at 1-833-LION-DEN. That's 1-833-546-6336. Or send a recording or written message to podcast at theapprofessor.org. If you want to come on the podcast or want to suggest a guest, let us know that too. I'll see you down the road. The A&P Professor is hosted by Dr. Kevin Patton, an award-winning professor and textbook author in human anatomy and physiology. This podcast is for professional use only. 